If you look back at U.S. foreign policy, it actually doesn't change that much. That's not true this cycle. Biden and Trump are articulating profoundly different worldviews and a profoundly different set of policies to pursue those views. This is Jay Martin. My guest today is Jacob Shapiro. He's incredibly tapped into Washington, to the geopolitical landscape, and to the investment world through his work at Cognitive Investments. He believes the upcoming American election will be the most consequential event in geopolitics in the world. And so today we talk about why. As always, if you enjoy my content, hit the link right beneath this video where you can subscribe to my weekly newsletter and join over 40,000 investors who hear from me each Sunday morning where I break down my key takeaways and action items from conversations just like this and plenty more. Here is Jacob Shapiro. Enjoy. All right, Jacob, recently I heard you say on another podcast that the upcoming American election could turn out to be the most important geopolitical events in the world right now. So did I capture that correctly? Do you still believe that could be the case? And if so, would you mind expanding on that for me? So it is the case. Um, You know, certainly other things can happen that we can't predict. But in terms of predictable events that are going to happen this year, it's far and away the biggest. And I think you can see this in the global, both international political system, financial system, how trade is working right now, because Um, U.S. enemies and allies alike are all staring at the poll numbers and trying to figure out, well, what does this mean? If Biden is elected, what does that mean for us? If Trump is elected, what does that mean for us? And how do we position ourselves um, accordingly? So I think it absolutely is going to be the most important geopolitical event of the year. And one of the reasons I think that is because if you look back at U.S. foreign policy from presidential administration to administration, it actually doesn't change that much. Like there's a lot of rhetorical melodrama on the campaign trail about how much different one candidate is going to be than the other. And that there's some truth to that when it comes to domestic policy. But the constraints of geopolitics usually prevent U.S. presidents from authoring huge changes. I mean, just think about the fact that multiple U.S. presidents wanted to get out of Afghanistan. Multiple U.S. presidents from multiple parties couldn't do it. Wanted to get out of Iraq. Wanted. To, we've been talking about the pivot to Asia for, what, four administrations now across different parties? It doesn't happen. Um, that's not true this cycle. Uh, Biden and Trump are articulating profoundly different worldviews and a profoundly different set of policies to pursue those views. So if Biden was reelected, as just an example, you'd continue with, I'd call them mild protectionist policies, but also trying to strengthen American relationships with allies in Europe, um, in Asia, like South Korea and Japan. That's one of the, the places that I think the Biden administration's had the most success that they haven't gotten credit for. Trump, The Trump administration, and just go look at Trump's campaign website or some of the policy papers that are out there, he's talking about 60% tariffs on everything that comes in from China. He's talking mm-hmm. about 10% blanket tariffs on all imports, period. Like th- Those are completely different worlds and a completely different set of circumstances you have to prepare for. And that's just one small example. So th- that's why I say it's so important and why, I mean, the world may feel like there's a lot going going on from my perspective there's not there's a lot of waiting and seeing and positioning and trying to read the tea leaves fascinating okay so that that is counter and i'm glad that you phrased it this way because one of your peers george friedman you know has written um was it the 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 coming the storm before the calm i believe is Mm -hmm. his book where he really outlined the case for how ineffective an American president is. And that's kind of the beauty of the American constitution is that it limits the power of any one man. And as a consequence, we put a lot of weights on the US president when in reality, it usually doesn't matter so much. And you're saying right now, there's a few reasons why that thesis can be altered, right? And you mentioned Trump essentially restarting the trade war on day one, if he's elected, that's probably his plan. Do you read it that way? I do. And I mean, George trained me. So like with due respect to the the guru, who is the only reason that I have a career in this space, uh, one of the places where George and I always differed, even when I was a young whippersnapper, was that I always thought that the individual had more agency than his constraint based framework accounted for. Now, I don't go all the I don't think that individuals are omnipotent. I think they are eventually subject to constraints. But I think if we look back at US history, we can see similar moments in time where the system started to fray at the seams, and you saw the importance of individuals rise. And the examples I usually point out are the 1850s, the 1920s, and the 1970s. So in each one of those sort of periods, in the decade before them, you had incredible instability, whether it was political, financial, economic in the system. And it took 
sort of the emergence of very, very strong and forward thinking strategic individuals to push things forward. So Abraham Lincoln did that in the context of the Civil War. Probably the Civil War is much different if George McClellan is the leader of the Union. Uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is born of the crisis of the 1920s and in some ways refounds the American Republic. The the Republic after Roosevelt looks nothing like it did before the Republic with all the things, whether we talk about World War II and mobilization or, you know, security nets and entitlements, like that's all, those are all innovations of FDR. And the same is true of the Reagan administration. We go from the stagflation era of the 70s and an oil price crisis and everything else to deregulation, victory in the Cold War, you know, sort of eight years of of a Republican majority that that really changes the face of the Republic and sets the stage for globalization going forward. So I think you have these periods of time where individuals can be profoundly important. A foreign policy example of this or a more geopolitical example is Vladimir Putin. Like it's probably going to end up the same way it would for Russia, no matter what, because the constraints will apply themselves. But the reason Russia invaded Ukraine when it did was because Putin thought it was a good idea. And he was the one who could order the soldiers in. So in, in that sort of sense, like I do think there there is um, a place and agency for individuals. And the last thing I'll say here is just this is why when you're using geopolitics or macro as a tool, I always talk about how there are limits to it. Because if you just use geopolitics, you might get things right in the long run, but you'll get your face ripped off in the short term. Because the shorter sort of your time horizon for the decision, the more intelligence matters, the more access to the individual who is actually making the decisions matter. Um, so it's sort of this constant dance between long-term frameworks and short-term intelligence and having them communicating back and forth. That's where I try to live anyway. Mm, okay. I, I love that take. You know, I'm trying to digest it a little bit and it's like we can we can spot these major macro headwinds and tailwinds and they're somewhat immovable and tough to change. But interspersed among these trends are human nature. And there are some humans who have massive decision-making ability, and those can create black swan events that are just hard to predict and therefore can shake that trend, correct? Yeah, absolutely. I should, I should, uh, I should write that down because that was far more <laughs> succinct and clear than I usually say it. Okay, so, so breaking down the various stakeholders who are watching the American polls, we touched on you know, if Trump wins the election, he's likely to restart the China trade war on day one. I had Elbridge Colby on my podcast a mm. couple of weeks ago, and, you know, he makes the argument that regardless of what's happening in um, Europe, regardless of what's happening in the Middle East, China is the number one threat facing America. Um, and he says that just because they're the most powerful nation rising in terms of, I guess, global power. Do you agree with that? And if so, you know, what's the consequence of Trump putting the crosshairs on China uh, on his first day in office? So I sort of agree with that, but let, let's like add a little bit of nuance, which I respect Eldridge, but I, I think he's, he's short on the nuance when it comes to his takes. The first is if we're talking about state actors, yes. Like I would say that there are other threats like climate change. We just saw this with the pandemic um, that are maybe more threatening. We're also seeing this with um, in the Red Sea right now, the news that the Houthis either intentionally or unintentionally went after a submarine cable. Like that's the sort of thing that really keeps me up at night um, yeah. rather than, you know, China's going to march through the Gulf of Mexico and invade the United States at any point in the next 10 to 15 years like that's sort of laughable I will and I, I also the other bit of nuance that I would sort of inject here is that it's something of a self-fulfilling prophecy um, the United States under multiple presidential administrations of both parties has identified both Russia and China as the strategic peer competitors um, which is a little bit strange because Russia and China are not natural friends um, the whole brilliance of the Nixon administration was to make friends with China because the Soviet Union was the bigger threat. When you make those two countries the big threats, you're basically forcing them together to align their interests, which is exactly what the United States has done by calling both of them out in recent national security strategies as the peer threats, not just China. Um, China also, though, is unique among potential rivals to the United States because it's the first time that we've met a potential rival that is bigger than us that can outproduce us that has, I mean, bigger, not just in terms of, uh, I mean, in terms of population, in some sense has more human capital. Think about our previous rivals, whether, whether it was the Soviet union or Japan or Germany, these were all countries that were fundamentally flawed and on paper were weaker than the United States. That's not true of China. The weakness of China, you have to get into the intangibles of the Chinese communist party and can authoritarian dictatorships really create societies that when squared up against a liberal democracy like the United States will do well. Um, you know, authoritarianism versus creativity and individual, um, 
uh, mm-hmm. liberties and things like that. Like that's an interesting conversation, but we've really never dealt with a threat quite like this. Um, the last thing I'll just say here, though, is that I think that the United States has misread Chinese intentions. And, it, and this is where it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, too. And, and maybe I'm wrong about this. Maybe I'm naive. But it's pretty clear to me that China does not want to dominate the world. It does not want to take over uh, Texas or California or Florida or anything like that. They want to be the strongest nation in their ancestral lands and in their own regional sphere of influence. So do they want Taiwan back? Absolutely. They want everything in that nine dash line that they talk about to be Chinese, both mm. in reality and that everybody respects it that way. By the way, that also means they want Vladivostok back, which the ah. Russians took from them in the 1900s. So like there's, yeah. there are multiple countries here, even their so-called allies that are going to have to worry about this. Um, but I don't think they want to extend beyond that. China used to be known as the middle kingdom because it was an economic center of gravity because all roads, whether it was the Silk Road or what, what have you, led back there. I think that's what they want. They want to be sovereign and strong in their own sphere of influence and have respect in that territory. I don't think they're looking to, you know, vie with the United States for global hegemony. But if you go after them, they're not going to take it lightly. Like they had a hundred years. It's their, literally, they call it the century of humiliation where they didn't punch back when the West came after them. So if you go after them, like they'll be, they'll spoil for the fight. Like they're not just going to take it sitting like they did um, in the, in the 1800s when a few British ships were able to subdue it. So Mm-hmm. Yes, their arrival. Yes, their resources should scare U.S. strategic planners. Um, but I think the lack of nuance in how the United States is treating China is eventually going to come back to bite it in, in the butt. You've noticed a shift in the world of finance. The smartest investors in the world are no longer gambling on overvalued tech stocks. They're investing in the raw materials that power our world. Commodities. No, I've been a commodity investor for over 15 years, and I'm the host of one of the world's largest commodity investment conferences. I teach a 10 chapter course on commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom. Get started today. That's interesting. And I love that you mentioned the century of humiliation. I think it's, it's very important to understand that piece of Chinese history. And, you know, we're talking about the opium wars effectively, mm-hmm. which is not really taught in American, Canadian, pr- probably in Western school systems, but it's a major point of, uh, of academics in, in China. And this is a, a you know, everyone's well aware of what, what occurred. And there was a period of time where China was effectively carved up by the British, the French, the French, and the Russians who came to the defense, if I believe, of the Chinese in exchange for some territories, including the very important port city of Vladivostok. And so you mentioned, yes, China wants Taiwan back, but there's a lot of other areas, cities, and regions that they probably want back as well. Would you extend that to their South Asia, they're like... Um, uh, Southeast Asian colonies like Vietnam. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that those were effectively Chinese regions. Yeah, so I've actually, I, I wrote an article a couple of years ago, which is still one of the best things I ever wrote called The Third Opium War and talking about how the period that we're in right now, I think sort of fits the criteria because there were the, the two first opi- opium wars. Um, look, I don't think China wants to conquer Vietnam, but they certainly want all of these countries in Southeast Asia to be, um, for lack of a better word, vassal states. Um, mm. They want them to be dependent on the Chinese economy and they want them to respect China's territorial claims in the South China Sea. And if they find energy or if they need access to the fishing resources in the South China Sea, they don't want to hear about how Vietnam claims some of it too and the Philippines claim some of it too. They want it to be respected as Chinese. Um, but the, the Chinese know well from their own personal history that they're not going to conquer Vietnam. They're not mm. going to go in and conquer Cambodia. That's why they're talking about the Belt and Road Initiative to build infrastructure or making them dependent on Chinese finance or making them dependent on the access to the Chinese market. So um, it's a form of economic imperialism, but I don't think it'll it'll bridge the gap to territorial imperialism. And this, by the way, is a good way to judge folks like me versus folks like Eldridge, because I think sort of in Eldridge's commentary and people and China hawks like that, they would probably listen to this interview and say, Jacob, you're naive. That's not how it's going to work. Like they won't stop until they take everything. And I'd say, okay, like the, the day they invade Vietnam, I'll come back on your show and do a mea culpa. But I don't think it's happened. 
Do you see these situations? I haven't read your article. I'm sorry, but I'm going to dig it up right after this interview because it sounds fascinating. Uh, the third opium war, uh, Jacob. Do you see today's scenario in any way mirroring the dynamics uh, of the 1800s, meaning when British, when the British Navy showed up and essentially smashed the fortresses, uh, took Hong Kong, sold opium to a population who didn't want it effectively from the top down? Um, you know, Russia was kind of the mediator, right? These treaties that were signed were somewhat enforced by Russia stepping in as the third party. And, you know, to their advantage, they were able to gain strategic territories like Vladivostok in exchange for providing defense to China. Is that dynamic kind of turned on its head right now where Russia's, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in a war that they're probably winning, um, but they're somewhat of a pariah state now as a consequence, and they, they need China's assistance moving forward. Do you agree with that? And does that provide the like the mirrored opportunity for China to step in and mediate on behalf of Russia in exchange for gaining some of these territories back. That's an interesting scenario, and it's a possible one, but I, w I wouldn't say it's it's the most likely necessarily. I mean, yeah. when when Russia first invaded Ukraine, I joked that all that Putin had accomplished was transformed Russia from a great power into a Chinese gas station, and I still stand by that. Now, the the ironic thing is that. Russia doesn't think that way. I used to travel to Moscow and give talks at various conferences and things like that before the war started. I won't be going anytime soon, I don't think. And I had conversations at times with, you know, the Russian versions of me, the analysts like me who are doing this in the Russian environment. And they would talk about how China was the junior partner and that it was, uh, it behooved Russia to educate China in the way of geopolitics to help them rise to great power status, which that's a delusion. Like China is the great power. Their economy could swallow the Russian economy many times over. And if China decided it wanted to stop importing things from Russia, I doubt that Russia could stay in the fight as long as it is. And I think the other thing here is that Russia is really a declining power. Um, yes, maybe things have gone well for Putin in the last year or two in Ukraine, but he's not going to get much further than Ukraine. And I'm, it's not clear to me he's going to complete the conquest of Ukraine. Even if he can defeat um, the Ukrainian armed forces, let's say he deposes Zelensky, that's going to be a long-term insurgency for decades. It's going to make Iraq look like child's play by comparison, or the Soviet exper experiment in Afghanistan look um, you know, childlike by comparison. And in the meantime, Russia's demographics are terrible. All the smart people have left because they don't want to live under Putin. I mean, it's a pretty grim reality when you try and break down what's going on there. The other thing is that, um, and the other main difference between sort of the previous opium wars and what's happening now is that China's not weak. When the West discovered and when Russia discovered China in the 1800s, 1850s, um, China's uh, imperial power is falling apart. The emperor was basically wearing no clothes. Um, that's not true right now. The Chinese Communist Party is not weakening. If anything, it's asserting stronger power. Now, maybe in the future that will sow the seeds of their own demise, but this doesn't look like a Chinese dynasty that's coming apart. This looks like a Chinese dynasty that is reaching its zenith, that is expressing more power. Um, so I'm not sure that 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 when you flip it that way that it's going to work and i think the west is treating china like oh it's still dependent on foreign technology it's still dependent on foreign capital flows it's still dependent on access to these markets we can still treat china the way that we used to and china's basically saying good luck trying like yes it's asymmetric yes you're more powerful than us than the aggregate but we can make things very difficult and very painful if you keep on pushing that path so in that sense it's it's very different from there and i don't see how china's going to intervene um, in the way that you talked about with Russia, precisely because it's good for China to have Russia on the board. The more that yeah. Russia is stable and the more Russia is causing problems in Eastern Europe, the less that the United States and NATO and the European Union can focus on China. So honestly, the best case scenario for, for China is, hey, Russia, stay in the war, but also stay together and we will help prop you up and continue your war in Ukraine for as long as you want. We'll keep uh, importing that cheap natural gas and oil and every all the foodstuffs and everything else we want from you. It's a great deal. Mm. I, I want to ask you just one more question on maybe specifically this article, and you probably covered it in your previous answer here, Jacob, but what is the third opium war? What, what exactly is the dynamic that you, you wrote about? Well, just exactly the sort of economic competition over, um, you know, sort of Chinese markets and where the West is thinking, okay, like we are going to use either tariffs or sanctions or restrictions on technology and IP to bring the Chinese government to heel and to open up market access. Like even all of these protectionist practices that you're seeing within the United States, there's also a goal into opening Chinese markets for U.S. companies. Look at 
the strategy, so annual strategy statements for almost any U.S. company, and you will find that all of them were predicting growth based on access to Chinese markets. Mm. So the United States sort of it, government is doing this twin thing, where on the one hand they want to be more self sufficient when it comes to critical sort of commanding heights technologies, but on the other hand they know that U.S. companies need access to that Chinese market, otherwise all their growth prospects go out the door. There's no place that's going to grow like China is over the next five to ten years anywhere else in the world. Demographics aside, maybe mm. India, but India's sort of a basket case in a lot of different ways, and the United States is going to have a lot of competition there.、Um, So it's that dynamic that is that resembles the first two opium wars. You have Western powers that want access to Chinese markets on their terms, and the、right. difference is, whereas 200 years ago China basically had to had to say, okay, like you can have access and you can even have some of our territory. This time China is pushing back, and you know whether it's、um, blocking mi-、uh, minerals and material resources that they have the monopoly on refining. Uh, to sort of hurt Western companies that way, whether it is making life more difficult for Western companies inside China, whether it's supporting state champions and very slowly and quietly muscling U.S. companies out of the Chinese market for areas where Chinese companies now produce the things that they don't need from abroad, whether it's turning around and the drug trade with fentanyl through Mexico into the United States, like there's a nice little drug parallel there, where instead of the Western countries putting opium into China, China is sending some of these things out through Mexico into the United States. So there's all these. Sort of nice parallels there. So the the big difference, as I say, is that China is not as weak as it was before. But it's those dynamics that make me think of、Got、that、it. time in the 1850s as a historical analog. Got it. What is your take on the TikTok ban, Jacob? Do you think it will ultimately pass? And if so, what's the likely next step? Does ByteDance just divest and sell this to an American corporation? What's your take on this? Yeah, I have a difficult time.、Um, Generating much interest in TikTok, and I've talked to various, you know, U.S. Chinese security analysts who tell me that I should be paying more attention because it really is a threat. But I just don't buy it. I don't think that it means anything that the Chinese Communist Party can track what cat videos I send to my wife when I'm on business trips because I'm doom scrolling、uh, on TikTok. To the extent that there is a threat,、um, if you're in the U.S. Defense or security or intelligence establishment. Okay, so don't be dumb enough to have TikTok on your phone. This should be something that is relatively easy to enforce. Of course, our last two presidents were found with secret documents in places that they shouldn't be. So maybe I'm giving the establishment a little a little too much credit. I think the longer term implication here is that the United States is behaving in the way that it tells all other countries not to behave. Um, it's a very thuggish thing to do to go to a successful foreign company and say if you want to remain active in our market. You have to divest, or you have to do X, Y, and Z. Otherwise, we're going to kick you out. I mean, that's straight up thuggish behavior. If China did that to the United States, we'd be screaming to the WTO and anybody else who would listen. And we're turning ar- around and doing there. So I think we're risking,、um, or at least I think the U.S. is risking its reputation as a place for rule of law and for opportunity、uh, and for laissez-faire markets and things like that. So that some American businesses can get their hands on a social media company that has done better than our social media companies,、mm. um, I, I think that's the long-term implication. I have a very hard time sort of taking seriously the national security dimension of TikTok.、Um, and and about, sort of last thing here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, what about reciprocal trade? Because I, as I understood, you, you can't access a lot of the American tech. Platforms in China, but China's got TikTok in America, and that's where a lot of the controversy lies. That there isn't reciprocal trade. But what's your take? Fine, then then bar them. But that's not what we're talking about. Like that,、mm-hmm. like we're talking about. No, you have to divest to U.S. companies. That U.S.、Okay. investors or companies are going to profit from you divesting. So, like、mm-hmm. if if we're that serious about the Great Firewall and we want to have a Great Firewall of our own, if we're not going to trust. Um, you know, I think twenty, thirty years ago, we would have trusted in globalization, and we would have trusted that, however hard it was for Chinese citizens to get access to YouTube or anything else, that eventually、um, the charisma of you know pop songs and all the things that happen in U.S. culture, which still define a lot of cultural norms,、uh, whether it's the latest news about Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey to anything else beyond there, that eventually that would have soaked into the system and it would have created desires for individual rights and creativity in those markets. If we've become so insecure that we don't think that that's worthwhile and we want to block it off, 
great. That's like for like. Have our own firewall. Then all countries will have their own firewalls. And it's going to be really interesting to see how the internet shifts from an open network where everybody plays to national networks, which is going to have a lot of infrastructure and investment around it too to make that actually functional. Um, but again, that that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, hey, ByteDance, it's okay if you're in the U.S. market. You just can't be a Chinese company in the U.S. market. We need right. U.S. investor A to line his pockets or her pockets because they get to, you know, sort of spread out this social media poison. Like that, that's the part where I say like that, like we're supposed to be the model for how we want other countries to behave. If that's the model that we have, don't be surprised when it happens to us companies. And I know ByteDance has said they will not sell. I don't, I'm not sure if that's just posturing if the ban does occur, but I, you know, I, I read this as there's no possible way TikTok is banned in America. Um, unless ByteDance really does refuse to sell, but this is like a trillion dollar sale. I mean, it's $800 billion company. And of course, there's going to be a lineup of American uh, private equity firms to, to buy this thing because the data scraping competency and the user base is just way too attractive to ban, to, to do any kind of an outright ban. I mean, the opportunity is just too great if you're in that business. Yeah. I mean, I'll also just, I'll take the opportunity to, to say here, like, because we're having all these conversations about the geopolitical intrigue around TikTok, which even as a guy who does geopolitics for a living, I have trouble sort of um, getting up for. I don't think we're having the deeper conversation, which is what is TikTok and social media in general doing to our minds? And what is it doing to our children? And how does it affect, how does it affect our attention spans and our elections and trust and in information and in institutions, which are the things that make the United States was it, it what it is? Like that to me is the important part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, and that part of the conversation isn't there. It's all about this sort of China national security mumbo jumbo, which is the only thing that seems to be able to get things done in the U.S. Congress. Um, we can do the CHIPS Act because there's threats about China in Taiwan. Uh, but immigration law reform, thoughts about social media information and legitimacy of you know information institutions, election, any, any of the many things that need to happen in the United States that you can't blame China for. OK, that stuff doesn't get done because Congress is, bigger, is busy squabbling with itself. And this gets back to what we started with, where why the U.S. election is so important, because we are so busy squabbling with ourselves over things that don't matter, like TikTok or which bathroom someone can go to. And we are missing that a multipolar world with real challengers, whether it's China or Russia or Turkey or India or Brazil, is emerging and they don't want to keep on doing what the United States says. And we haven't lived in an, in an environment like that in basically since World War II ended. Mm. Does that, I mean, that's a, that's a big topic. And I, I look at the trend of, um, populism and just the civil unrest that's kind of erupted over the last eight years to some pretty skyrocketing, skyrocketing crescendos. And we're probably going to see a repeat of this following the November election, regardless of which way it goes. Um, I look at the lack of civil discourse or inability to agree on pretty much everything, how every small issue has become a major issue culturally dividing the people. And I agree. I think a lot of that's due to everybody going down independent rabbit holes on social media and just confirming their biases to the ump degree. What's the, what's the end game there, Jacob? Like it's hard to, it's hard to be optimistic about the future when you look at the trajectory of culture in the United States and in Canada. Like I'm, my family's American Canadian, my wife's American, I'm Canadian. You know, we spend lots of time North and South, but it's kind of the same up here, at least in the metropolis. I'm in a small town. It's not that way, but in the cities it is. Um, what's your take on the future of, of culture in, in the United States? Again, th this is, um, and this sort of, you, you mentioned George already in his book. This is one area where I sort of do agree with George. Um, and I referenced the 1920s and the 1970s as base cases. Um, in both of those, in both of those eras, it was a similar feeling of, you know, society is coming apart. Morality is declining. Things are not going well. The United States is losing its standing. And then, you know, there's a major political change. A new party and a new leader comes in with enough support and power to make real meaningful and sometimes painful reforms, and it sets the stage for American power going forward. The thing that distresses me about right now is those previous periods of change where the United States woke up and decided to focus on things that were important. The, the, the impetus for that change was the economy sucked. Something was wrong with the economy and it was, okay, we all need to look at each other now because our livelihoods are actually going away. Our wages are going down. We're dealing with a great depression. We're dealing with sky high energy prices, whatever it was. And so the silent majority asserts itself and says enough of these radicals on both sides, enough of this nonsense, like let's actually get things done. Um, the economy doesn't suck today. 
the economy is running too hot. I've been saying for months, I didn't think the Fed was going to be in a position um, to cut rates meaningfully this year. I was sort of treated as a looney tune when I started saying that. And now it's becoming some, somewhat of the mainstream narrative, which is to say, I think we're in for um, more years of chaos because it is going to take that kind of cataclysm in people's pocketbooks that cause them to stop squabbling about the stuff that isn't that important and say, okay, now you're affecting things that actually affect my livelihood in a real tangible way. And we can't keep mm -hmm. going down this path. So I think the United States has the political structure and the flexibility to change. That's one of the things that makes it different than a country like China or Russia. They can't change. Um, they look good at times when the dictator is powerful and they can just say something and it happens. Um, the, the way that democracies really shine is in periods of stress like this, they evolve, they change under that pressure. I just think, unfortunately, we're at the very beginning stages of that process of change. And probably there's going to be more pain before we get to whatever it looks like at the end of this. And we start focusing on the things um, that are actually important. And this is, um, you know, the other thing about this is that most countries in the world, almost all countries in the world would love to have the problems that the United States has. There are no problems the United States faces that it can't fix. We have plenty of food. We have plenty of energy. Uh, we are control many of the commanding heights of the tech economy. We are still a place where immigrants want to come to. So many immigrants want to come to for a better life here that it's causing domestic political crises. But that tells you that people still look at the United States as a leader. Um, the demise of the dollar has been much exaggerated because in times of geopolitical strife, doesn't matter if debt's going up, people still want the dollar because the United States is still seen as the safest and, and most sure bet out there. So even as things are like, I don't want to paint too big a picture of gloom because relative to what's going on in many other places in the world, the United States is still very powerful and very secure. Um, but you know, the, the best, the best take that I can give you is that I think that we will come out of this eventually, but I don't see that it's going to happen anytime soon. I think we're going to have to see some kind of real problems in the economy to force us to face the issues that are in front of us. Cause right now, all of these, um, you know, little fast food issues at the surface are capturing our attention and we're ignoring the deeper things underneath the system. Okay. And also worth mentioning maybe that as polarized as America may seem and as divided as it may seem, that's far from an American problem. And when I talk to friends of mine in, in London or Berlin or Cape Town, it's the exact same scenario, a complete lack of civil discourse, um, crazy divisions between the populations, same up here in the cities in Canada. Uh, okay, I want to pivot. I want to get back to my initial question about the American election being the most significant geopolitical events on the board right now. But let's go to a different region. We, we talked about uh, Asia and South Asia. Let's look at Europe now. How does the strategy in Ukraine change from an American standpoint in the event of a change in administration come November where Donald Trump retains the president seat? Well, if you believe the reports that came out of Budapest, what was it, a week or two ago, where Orban said that Trump told him his plan to basically withdraw all aid from Ukraine to try and force a peace deal, uh, that tells you what a huge, massive change is going to be in general. Um, but I get asked this question a lot, and I would say that the future of Ukraine is honestly not going to depend on what the United States does. Whether Trump comes in and yanks aid immediately, uh, whether Biden continues aid for a couple of years before more and more of the American electorate gets tired of it and more of the American electorate is getting tired of it. We've gone from um, the share of Americans saying the United States is doing too much was last year around 20 percent. It's over 40 percent now. So let's say it doubles in another year. Now you're going to have the majority saying we're doing too much. Right. Um, but Ukraine is just fundamentally not an existential interest for the United States. It is an existential interest for Europe. Um, and whether Ukraine is going to make it and is going to be a sovereign power at the end of this war is going to depend on whether Europe decides to put its big boy pants on and depend on itself. And if it sees some value in keeping Ukraine propped up with weapons and money and all these other things. And ironically here, um, it would be bad for Ukraine if Trump was elected, if, if he's serious about withdrawing the support. But it would be good because that would definitely light a fire under the ass of all the European leaders to do things a little bit differently. It would really lend credence to the warnings that French President Emmanuel Macron has been making for months about how Europe needs sovereignty when it comes to defense um, and its economy and data and trade and everything else. Um, so maybe you accelerate sort of European self-sufficiency and European support for Ukraine if you get a Trump 
presidency in power. Whereas if Biden stays in, Biden's an old school politician. He wants to support Ukraine. Like in his soul, he obviously wants to do that. So he'll push it as long as he can. And the executive can do a lot of different things. He can't do everything he would want because he would need congressional support for everything. Um, but there's a lot the president can do to push things in that direction just himself. And he'll continue to do so. But at the same time, that will breed more complacency in Europe. Because European leaders will say, oh, the Trump threat was averted. Uh, we're not being threatened by getting kicked out of NATO anymore. Uh, Trump was just a fever dream, and he's now been defeated twice decisively. Like the United States has gotten its house in order again. And you can see how that would be fundamentally bad for Ukraine. So that's it's sort of a catch-22 there for Ukraine. Do you want support mm -hmm. from the United States, but then probably less urgency from Europe? Or do you want the rug yanked out from underneath you in the United States so that Europe steps up and says, okay, like we mean it. We want you in the European Union. We don't mm -hmm. want Russia to win this war. Europe is saying that and not doing that. Um, Ukraine needs Europe to do that, I think, if it's going to survive. Okay. So in this scenario where there is a change of administration in the White House come November, I, I see this playing out maybe two ways for Europe. If, you know, what Trump you know, allegedly leaked to Viktor Orban was true, that he will immediately or as soon as possible withdraw from the Ukraine. Now, you outlined one case. I want to present both and then get your thoughts on this. So we tend to generalize Europe as being one entity, right? Like, what will Europe do, right? When in reality, Europe is a collection of independent countries who make independent decisions for their own independent interests. And if the United States withdraws and Europe is left to stand on their own two feet, I would say they are massively ill prepared for combat uh, without the support of the Americans. And yes, maybe this would light a fire under their butts and they would start to arm. But some countries may just say, look, this is way too little too late. We, we cannot possibly get our act together in time to make a meaningful um, uh, defense against uh, Russian interest. And so I'm going to make a deal with Putin. Maybe France raises their hand, maybe Germany, maybe, you know, maybe independent countries start saying we're going to act independently because collectively we're not up to the task, right? And this actually becomes the fracturing of the European Union as a consequence, right? Do you see that as a potential outcome? And if so, how likely? The other would be, as you outlined it, no, nothing unites a country or a group of people like a common enemy. And in the withdrawal of American forces, Europe being left them to stand on their own two would be, you know, the unifying mission that that continent needs to actually band together and make the European Union much stronger. Um, what's your take on that, Jacob? So we've already seen sort of halting steps of the European Union taking steps together that they wouldn't have before as a result of both COVID and the Russian invasion. I mean, the joint issuance of debt, that was a big deal when it happened in 2020. And you know, the, the EU has crossed some Rubicons in that way. I, I'm also not sure that a fracturing of the European Union would be a bad thing. If you had underneath the umbrella of the EU 27, say 11 states that were like, you know what? Def on, on defense level, we also agree. We want greater integration when it comes to defense. And that concentric circle lives underneath the EU. But those 11 countries will move forward without um, a country like Hungary being able to block everything up. That sounds like a bureaucracy that's actually more effective. So if it forces Europe to figure out levels of engagement within the EU, where some want to be part of it more and some want to be part of it less, and there can't just be one small country that gums up the system for everybody, I think that would be a net positive. Um, the second thing I would just say is you're right that Europe's not a monolith, but what we're really talking about here is Germany. France okay. has very different ideas about how the European Union should be, and Germany has very different ideas. And as long as France and Germany are at odds about defense and about support for Ukraine and things like that, like that's the whole ball game. Uh, Germany's economic influence uh, is so profound over most of these states, including Hungary, that if Germany decided, no, we agree with France, or if Germany sort of pronounced its own very strong set of foreign policy, I think it would pull most of Europe after it. Um, the Germany that we have today is very weak. It's very internally fractured. That traffic light coalition has three different parties that have basically nothing in common. And the sooner that government collapses, the sooner you will get a chance for Europe to figure out whether this is even viable and whether they can put things together. But for as long as Germany and Chancellor Scholz is sitting there and he can't follow through on anything because of how uh, fractious uh, his uh, domestic German politics are, probably Europe is stuck um, in this in this nebula this nebulous region that it is now. So for that reason, um, you know, watch very watch German domestic politics very very closely. If you got 
sort of the rise of a CDU, CSU, and maybe they throw AFD in the coalition as well. And they have real power um, to make changes and to ally itself with some French version of reform of the EU or proposing their own and supporting Ukraine that way. Uh, we've seen throughout history how quickly the German industrial military complex can gear up if it decides it wants to. Um, oh, so okay. like that's, that, that's where I think in that direction. But I think if you're sitting here right now on Wednesday, March 20th, yeah, there's not a lot of like all that optimism that I just espoused sounds pretty far fetched. And I can't deny that because right now Macron is saying one thing, French polls are saying another thing. The Germans are completely convoluted. And the only countries that are really taking steps to help Ukraine are, you know, the Czechs are talking about making ammunition and sending it and restarting factories. The Danes are talking about restarting factories and building some of these things, but sort of Europe in general, that old Kissinger, uh, Kissingerism of okay, I want to talk to Europe. Who do I call? Is still very much true today. Yeah. Okay. So, so there's a variety of countries who are discussing or taking concrete action to rearm effectively. Um, let Let me ask you. You know, I'll pull another quote from Elbridge Colby, who said, L "Listen, to sort of explain what needs to happen here, you need to understand two universal laws of nature. One is that weakness invites aggression, and the second is that strength discourages conflict. And people are always opposed to investing in military because nobody wants war. But what maybe they lack uh, understanding is that." military is what discourages war. Do you agree with that? Do you think that the uh, investment in military, I mean, here's the thing, like, you know, Colby, again, he advocates for, for massive increase in investment in the military for the United States, for Europe, for Canada. All these countries are broke, by the way. They're, I mean, that's the other side of this, right? Is that how exactly is this accomplished? But, you know, do you agree with that, that fundamental law that weakness invites aggression and that's enough reason for countries to invest in military and then how are they going to do it given their balance sheets i hope that colby uh footnoted churchill there because he's basically lifting directly from churchill in the 1930s <laughs> um all right that's a complicated question and this is an age-old sort of debate within u.s foreign policy and i definitely fall fall more in the camp of somebody like george kennan so if you go back and read his famous telegram x it's a very long telegram about how sclerotic the Soviet Union was, and it was a paper tiger, and it was going to fall apart because it didn't have sort of any internal moral code or societal cohesion. And he talks about how the real threat to the United States is if the United States internally no longer has that meaningful alternative, whether it's civic groups within society or trust in institutions or the best education system in the world or the best universities in the world. Like that was the real source of American strength. Um, and you can see this in the marriage of sort of what is what we define as military and what you define as tech today. The whole reason that we are having this conversation via Riverside and on our computers or on these devices that have chips is because the United States government in the 1950s decided that semiconductors were something really important because they needed the semiconductors to put them on missiles to make them more accurate in the context of the Cold War. We can talk about the space race, too, and all the things that the space race produced, which comes not because, oh, you know, weakness uh, leads to aggression, but because John F. Kennedy says we have to think about what we want to do. What can what like heights can we scale? What can we put our creative juices to? And you get the sort of dynamic growth that comes out of that. Um, the United States military is by far the most powerful in the world. We have like, what, nine aircraft carriers. I think China's working on number three. Our nuclear arsenal besides Russia's is unmatched. Um, like there's a lot of strength in the United States in general, but the places where we are not investing are places like education, like healthcare, um, all these places where the United States should be leading and it is not. Um, so I would, I would agree, generally speaking, that weakness does encourage aggression and that if you are weak, your enemies will come for you in different ways. But I don't think the answer to that question is five more aircraft carriers or new hypersonic missiles that will be able to fire at, you know, very cheap Houthi drones, uh, and they'll still fire the drones anyway and block the Red Sea shipping disruptions. I think the place like strength has military components. It also has societal components and U.S. military strength is still very strong. And I'm not worried about that budget going away. Nobody's going to cut military spending. The places where the United States is flashing weakness is in, is, is, are on those societal levels. And I wish that people like Colby um, would read George Cannon and think about, 
um, defense and strength, not just in terms of ships and guns and planes and things like that, but about the health of American society. Um, and this goes back, you know, we, we mentioned Lincoln earlier in the conversation, like a house divided on itself can't stand. Um, and that if destruction is to be the United States law, we will be its author. That's still the case for the United States. We are fairly unique among nations that it's not an external threat that is going to take us down. There are no external threats. Like it's really going to be if we can't get on the same page. So I agree, but probably not in the way that Colby would have thought. Yeah, you'd expand it more to say, look, the net asset value of a country is more than the military. It's the education system. It's the innovation sectors. It's the medical. It's the trade competency. All of this is what creates the strength of a nation. Um, and, you know, before I uh, hit record with you, I was reading, um, I'm reading some, uh, rereading China. Or Sorry, I just finished China by uh, Edward Rutherford. But um, uh, I just picked up London again, which is a fantastic mm. book and begins with you know, Peter Stuyvesant, right, on the island of Manhattan back when this was New Netherland. And one of his famous quotes, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it's he's writing a letter back to the governors in Netherland and says, you must understand at this time that um, trade requires the protection of the military and the military requires the proceeds of trade. And as a consequence, there will never be trade without war, nor war without trade. Um what do you think about that quote, Jacob? Do you think it's timeless and accurate? Do you think there's nuance in there? Or what's your take? Yeah, uh, I think that sums things up pretty well. I think we allowed ourselves in, um, in the era of United States unipolarity and of globalization to think that everyone wanted to become a liberal democracy like the United States. You see this mistake in Afghanistan. You see it in Iraq. You see this mistake with China as well, letting China into the WTO because the assumption was, oh, China will trade with us. They'll eventually become more like us. And exactly to your point, no, as countries get richer and more powerful, they want to preserve things for their own selves. There is no sense of a common universal good. We can hope that there might be one. And there are certainly challenges that might foster that climate change is coming for all of us, not for one country in particular. COVID came for all of us. It didn't care whether we were Chinese or American or European or Botswana, it didn't really matter. Um, but I think COVID is actually the depressing thing here that makes that Stuyvesant quote so, so cutting even today, because COVID should have been a moment where everyone came together. And instead, it was the exact opposite. We were hoarding PPE, and we were blaming this country for this and vaccine diplomacy, and we still don't give vaccines to certain other countries. because Oh, my God, it's going to be trade secrets. And like, if we can't come together over that kind of threat, which doesn't care what language we speak or who we are, um, hard for me to imagine there's any threat that we're going to come together with. I guess you have to root for aliens actually existing uh, for this to be. And maybe we'll still find a way to fight about that, too. Uh, that's certainly the Chinese three-body problem fictional series is about exactly that, right? Fascinating. Look, uh, Jacob, I want to thank you for coming on the show today and allowing me to tap your brain in front of my audience. I really do appreciate it. And this has been a fascinating conversation across the board. We covered a ton of ground and, and I learned a lot for anybody who wants to hear more from you uh, about what you're up to. Where should I point them today? Where can they find more of Jacob Shapiro? Yeah. I mean, the two easiest, our, our website at Cognitive Investments is under construction. So I'll give you two ways to get to me. Number one, I have a podcast of my own cognitive dissidents. Um, and maybe you'll come on Jay sometime too, or we can cross post or something. And then otherwise just email me at Jacob at cognitive dot investments. I work primarily with either investors, um, or companies trying to manage for geopolitical risk, either in their portfolios or their supply chains. And if any of that scratches an itch for you, or if you just want to tell me how, how wrong I am about something or a book I should read, just uh, email me directly, but no, no need to go through anything else. All right. Look, I appreciate that. Jacob, thanks again for your time today. This has been an absolute blast. Cheers, man. See you soon. Commodity investing for beginners. No complex strategies, just actionable information. Our comprehensive course breaks down the complexities so you can make informed decisions and gain financial freedom.